It was a cold and gray November day. I stood in a vacant lot in Chicago, the damp wind chilling me to the bone as I took in my surroundings. Small pieces of charred wood and soot-stained drywalls combined with pieces of broken glass littered the ground, and small pieces of light debris swept across the site, blown by the incessant wind. I felt like this scene was an apt metaphor for what my life had become, a burnt-out, empty shell of what it was, cold and forlorn, a monument to loneliness, bitterness, and failure. I kicked a piece of concrete and continued to think hard about what I could do with what I had left. I met Olivia at a charity fundraiser a few weeks after my 29th birthday. At the time, I was essentially number two in the family retail business, and my great-uncle Seth, the majority shareholder and CEO, told me to attend the event, to raise a flag, try to make friends, and maybe attract business. The event was very boring, filled with overdramatic, narcissistic people who thought that by raising a few thousand dollars to build a local library, they were on the same level as Mother Teresa. I was trying to be polite, nodding, smiling absentmindedly, sometimes biting my tongue until it bled, and desperately hoping for a chance to leave early when she quietly sank into the seat next to me, flashed a thousand-watt smile and spoke as if we were old friends. Olivia was light and graceful, a slender, brown-haired, bronze-skinned girl who exuded confidence and ease of communication, and suddenly I didn't mind fundraising at all. I've always been a pretty, headstrong, competitive guy in school, work, or sports, but I've never felt particularly comfortable in social situations. After graduating from business school, I was more or less married to my job, and this, combined with my inherent social awkwardness, made it doubly difficult to develop any experience with women. As a result of my shyness, I almost never approached a woman for a date unless I had known her for a long time. But I found Olivia irresistible, and by the end of the evening I asked her out to dinner. We ended up having a great time, and contrary to my fears, we had a lot of common interests and a lot to talk about. I quickly fell in love with her. The feeling was mutual, and by the time I took her home, it was clear that we would be seeing each other often. We dated for a few months as the romance took off, and it wasn't long before we were seeing each other a couple of times a week and spending a fair amount of time on each date having sex. I clearly liked her and was more than interested in getting her into bed. But I wasn't at all sure how to take the next step forward without risking painful rejection or even scaring her away forever. However, one evening, Olivia made it clear that she thought I was too slow, when instead of kissing me goodnight at the front door, she literally took matters into her own hands, unbuttoning my trousers and dragging me into the house by the one appendage that I was sure was behind that I will follow her. I wasn't a virgin, but I also didn't have much experience with women, and I always thought that lustful passion was a man's activity. Olivia was very willing to disabuse me of this. She gave me a ride that would have made a mechanical bull seem tame, and by the time we were done, I was completely and utterly exhausted at that moment. It was the most enjoyable thing I had ever done in my life. From that moment on, intimacy became frequent and easy, and our relationship deepened. Within a few months, we were living together, and a little more than a year after we met, we got married. We moved into a four-bedroom house in a nice neighborhood with trees, did some landscaping, got a dog, and life was very, very good. Almost everything about marriage suited me. The end of loneliness that I did not want to admit unconditional emotional support, the physical satisfaction of meaningful sex, having someone to love and be loved, it was everything I wanted and more. Of course, there were some problems. I was always a little busy at work, so Olivia was a little frustrated with my availability. And there were probably a few other habits that she found a little annoying. Naturally, something irritated me, too. Perhaps the biggest challenge was that we had to interact with her family a lot more than I would have liked. Don't get me wrong, I didn't dislike her family. They were good, decent people, generally polite, and didn't have any particularly unpleasant personality traits. But I just didn't want to spend much, much time with them. Her parents were an outgoing, friendly couple, and they seemed to like me, 
but they tended to lecture us about how we should live and put a certain amount of pressure on us to have children. But we were never around each other long enough for it to particularly annoy me, so it wasn't much of a problem. Her little sister, Mindy, and her husband were a little more problematic for me. Mindy was a shorter, slightly rounder version of Olivia. She dressed like Olivia, talked like Olivia, and when Olivia was around, she was never away from her for more than a few minutes. They were like virtual Siamese twins, whispering conspiratorially, laughing at inside jokes and gossiping shamelessly about friends and family. And since she and her husband lived 15 minutes away from us, we spent quite a lot of time together. There's nothing wrong with that, I suppose, and maybe it was jealousy, but when she was with Mindy, she wasn't really with me, and it was more than a little unpleasant. Mindy's husband didn't make things any better either. He was a tall, fair-haired, good-looking guy named Bruce, friendly, easygoing, and, in my opinion, not particularly smart. He took over his family's furniture store in Joliet, and it was his favorite and sometimes only topic of conversation. He talked about the store as if it were Microsoft and he was Bill Gates, bragging about how well it was run and how no one else in the furniture business knew what they were doing. The problem with this view was that the store was struggling, and I was sure anyone who knew anything about business knew that part of the problem was Bruce himself. But I wanted peace and I wanted Olivia to be happy, which meant not causing problems with her family. So I spent more than one evening nodding my head numbly as I listened to Bruce continued. We had been married almost two years when Olivia first asked me to help Mindy and Bruce. She had prepared a fancy dinner with candles and music to set the mood and dressed in a way that promised a nice night in bed. So as a typical newbie husband, I figured she was just interested in having a great role in the hay with me. But as the evening went on, it became clear that she had her own plans. She continued to talk about how lucky we were to have such a large income and how she felt we were in a great position to help others. Then, with an air of practical misery, she admitted how worried she was about Mindy and Bruce just getting by. It turned out that Bruce owed a certain amount of money and was having difficulty making payments, and without help he would not be able to complete his inventory list. I quickly realized where this was going and got down to business. How much do they need, Liv? She paused and raised her eyebrows, letting me know that I had confused her planned presentation. She chewed her lip, thought for a minute, and then looked shyly into my eyes. He needs fifty or sixty thousand. This will make them free and confident. I almost choked. Yes, we were doing well, but most of my money was tied up in a family trust, and that amount would have put a very, very big dent in our ready cash. I knew I could get the money out of the trust if I really needed it, but I didn't want to have to explain that to Bernie Blackman, our chief business attorney, who also handled the trust. He would do what I asked, but I knew that for the foreseeable future, he would be fussing with me to get the money back. He wasn't cruel. He just took his job of protecting the money in the trust as well as the business very seriously. As I thought about it, it was the only time in our entire marriage that I tried to brush off Olivia's serious request. I don't know, Liv. That's a lot of money. She frowned. Mindy says that he has some great ideas and that they will return the money right away. They make good money, if that's what you're worried about, I'm sure of it. Well, I wasn't sure about that. In fact, I was sure that I would flush a significant amount of money down the toilet if I sent it to Bruce. But I wanted Olivia to be happy, so I went ahead and wrote out a check for 60000 firmly telling Olivia that this meant that we will have to save a little until the money comes back. I once heard advice that if you lend money to relatives, assume that you will never see them again. This sets you up emotionally so that the relationship doesn't deteriorate if they don't return the money. So... In my understanding, it was a gift. A $60,000 gift to Olivia's sister and her relatively incompetent brother-in-law, which I didn't think would solve their problem because I knew he wasn't a good enough businessman to run his own store. Even with the money, I wasn't happy. But I wanted to be a good guy for her and her family. 
I wanted to please them and was ready to shell out 60000 to do it. Three or four months after I loaned Bruce the money, I was at home rummaging around the house for a flash drive that had important data on it. I had a bad habit of absent-mindedly putting important things in unusual places, so I practically ransacked the entire house. After checking all the usual places, I wandered into the guest room, looked around the table, and even looked under the bed. When I stood up, I noticed that it was unusually lumpy, at least by the standards of Olivia's house, and was definitely in more disarray than I was likely to cause. With my little searching, it was obvious that someone had been lying in it and had hastily pulled up the sheets and covers without making them properly. It didn't seem like a big deal to me at the time, but later that evening, I accidentally mentioned it to Olivia. Hey, did someone sleep in the guest bed? I went there recently and it was pretty unkempt. Olivia began to stutter her answer and looked flushed and nervous. Uh, uh, well, I, uh, took a nap there earlier. Sorry. I was cleaning and I was so exhausted that I just jumped into bed and didn't have time to clean anything. At that point in our marriage, I trusted Olivia so much that the thought that her explanation was anything other than God's honest truth did not occur to me. In fact, I remember thinking it was funny that she was nervous or embarrassed because she needed to take a nap in the middle of the day. But the blanket wasn't the only clue I missed. Over the next year or so, several more strange, inexplicable things happened that if I hadn't stuck my head so far up my ass, would have shown that Olivia was not a paragon of virtue. For example, I took it as gospel that her usually quiet job as an assistant manager at a small independent bookstore suddenly required her to attend a five- or six-hour non-stop meeting every Tuesday, a meeting that was so important that I shouldn't have tried to contact her. At this time, I also accepted all explanations about the small bruises that appeared on her body, some of them in relatively private places or the underwear in the wash that I did not remember her wearing, and then there was the story with orange juice. Olivia started shopping at a new high-end grocery store, which in itself wasn't much of a problem, except that she couldn't buy many of the things I liked, including my favorite brand of orange juice. I complained about this and asked her to change stores, but she insisted that the new store was better and much more convenient for her since it was right on the way home from her Tuesday meetings. Her grocery shopping choices might not seem like a particularly strong indicator that she was cheating, but it was the information that made me finally stop and think, which ultimately led to the epiphany that broke my heart. Less than 18 months after the first loan, Olivia began hinting that Bruce and Mindy might need more money. By that time, he had not returned even a fraction of the original 60000 And I did not want to give additional money, especially to support an enterprise that I considered unsustainable, so I brushed off Olivia's offer, hoping she'd get the hint and stop asking. But she kept at it and suggested that Mindy and Bruce might lose business if they couldn't upgrade and get more inventory. Still trying to be Mr. Popular, I felt like I couldn't say no outright, so I finally agreed to look at Bruce's business plan and tour his store to see what he wanted to do. I was hoping Olivia would back down if I at least confirmed that this was a bad investment. I met Bruce at his store on Monday morning, and with typical unbridled enthusiasm, he walked me around the store, showed me the floor plan, introduced me to the staff, smiled and patted me on the back like we were the greatest of friends. When we stopped to talk with someone, he spoke about his business plan and spoke with great confidence and sincerity about how he was confident that with a little more money to improve inventory and a few upgrades, the store would quickly turn a significant profit. Bruce and I sat down in his office for half an hour, and I shared my doubts as diplomatically as possible. I let him know that I thought the business had some pretty deep-seated problems. I implied that unless he could optimize and cut costs and prices, he was unlikely to truly increase customer interest and revenue, even with the changes he wanted to make. I even very gently suggested that he consider selling the business and doing some other work. But he was very offended by this and repeated that he was sure that a facelift was all that was needed to improve the situation. I didn't have the heart to directly say no to his request for money, so I explained that I didn't have enough personal funds to give him a large loan and that it would have to come from a trust. 
I told him I would go back and talk to Bernie and see if he could clear the way for the loan, but I couldn't guarantee anything. My plan was to avoid conflict and at least make it seem like I was making a legitimate effort to get him money before delivering the bad news and essentially blaming Bernie for turning him down. Cowardly, I know, but I wanted to keep peace in the family and wasn't in the mood to lose that much money. In truth, Bernie would do almost anything I asked him to do, but I always impressed upon everyone. I knew that he had to keep tight control of the trust and that I could not overrule his decisions. It may seem unfair to make Bernie out to be the bad guy, but to be honest, I think he enjoyed the role and never complained to me about it. At the end of the conversation, Bruce nodded his head and flashed a wide, confident smile, letting me know that he felt he would get the credit. He shook my hand firmly and patted me on the back again, making me feel even more guilty as I walked away. I pulled out of the parking lot and drove down the highway, thinking about meeting. Bruce and trying to mentally absolve myself of the sins of cowardice and borderline dishonesty that I had just committed in his store. I was driving along, not paying much attention to my surroundings, when I saw something that at first seemed like a strange coincidence, but then developed into a vague, disturbing thought. It was a grocery store, smaller than most big chains, painted green with a large Salvador sign. It looked so unusual that I was sure that I had never seen anything like it anywhere, but for some reason, the name rang a bell and I couldn't immediately understand why. I pondered this for several minutes before it finally dawned on me. Salvador's was the name of the store Olivia started shopping at a store that didn't stock my favorite orange juice and was much easier to get to. Only this store wasn't near her work, our house, or anywhere else it would make sense for her to be during the week. So it just didn't make any sense that this store was convenient for what she did on Tuesdays. Unless, of course, she did it in a furniture store. Thinking about it, some disturbing possibilities began to appear. I made a U-turn and drove past Salvador's, then headed back to Bruce's furniture store and sat in his parking lot for a few minutes. I pulled out my cell phone and checked that this was the only Salvador store in Chicago and then spent 15 or 20 minutes thinking about all the possible reasons why she might shop there. I considered the possibility that Olivia has another office in the area at work, that she might meet Mindy for lunch, that maybe she goes to a fitness club or something in the area. But my mind kept bringing me back to a conclusion I didn't want to face. Suddenly, I wanted more information and decided to take the bull by the horns and meet Bruce face to face. I jumped out of the car and walked briskly to the front door of the furniture store, where I noticed the clock written on the glass indicated that the store was open until 8 on weekdays, except on Tuesdays, when they closed at noon. The cancerous suspicion that arose a few minutes ago continued to grow. Slamming the door, I entered the store and headed towards the first employee. I saw a rather awkward, middle-aged man who was stirring coffee. I'm sorry, but sorry. I'm on a break now, he interrupted irritably. Look, I don't want to take up your time, but I need to talk to Bruce McCoy urgently. I have discussed some important financial issues with him and need more information. I looked at him expectantly, but he continued to stir his coffee and even took a sip, not paying attention to my request. One of the reasons they couldn't promote the product became apparent, and I waited a moment in stunned silence before speaking again, this time in a more urgent tone. Uh, seriously, this is very important, so could you call it for me? He looked at me warily, but eventually an expression of recognition appeared on his face. You're the guy who was here earlier with Bruce, right? Hey! Yes, come on in! Bruce is meeting with the supplier now, but you can wait for him in the break room if you want. I don't think he'll be around for too long. Maybe half an hour maximum. He walked me slowly back into the room and left me with a cup of coffee and the TV remote. I had a hastily hatched plan that involved me confronting Bruce head on and making a few bluffs about how I had hard evidence that he and Olivia were cheating. I would threaten that if he doesn't confess right away, the evidence will get to Mindy and the rest of the family. I decided that if Bruce cheated on her, then he would immediately split, and if not, then I would just have to live with this shame. Maybe you'll make a joke out of this or something. 
I walked around the room, replaying the speech in my head, imagining how I would hint that I had photographs or film, or even say that Olivia had confessed thinking about the upcoming confrontation. I began to absentmindedly look around the room. I scoured magazines for a bit and scrolled through a few TV channels before I decided to poke around a little for clues. It slowly dawned on me that if they were using the store to scam people, there was a very good chance it was happening in this break room, and if they were doing it here, they were almost certainly using the beat-up couch I was staring at. For a minute or two I thought about the sofa with some anger and trepidation. It was a faded pea green color with a couple of coffee stains and a tear in the fabric on one of the armrests. It had clearly seen better days and would probably be more at home in a junkyard or some second-hand store. I lifted the pillow, and my pulse quickened a little when I saw that it was a fold-out bed and there were sheets on it. I quickly checked that Bruce was still in his office and then pulled out the bed. The sheets were a mess, full of wrinkles, with a couple of slightly darker yellowed areas just where you'd expect a wet spot from sex. There looked to be a lipstick stain or two, and the bed smelled faintly of perfume. Opening the bed, I saw some debris on the floor under the sofa. So I reached into the space above the bed with my right hand stretched and strained to reach the unclean carpet below, pulling up the items one at a time. In the end, I found a pen, zero dollars, thirty-seven in change, a broken coffee cup, an empty tube of KY gel, and a receipt from a restaurant. The check was from a Mexican restaurant Olivia liked to eat at, and there was her signature there, smooth and elegant and incriminating. Even looking back, I realized that the check was just flimsy, circumstantial evidence that could easily be explained away by any number of stories or excuses. But somehow finding it lifted the final fog from my thoughts. And the little unpleasant oddities about her Tuesday appointment schedule, her bruises, her use of underwear, and the mess in her bed all added up to a clear picture of a cheating wife and a shitty brother-in-law. Suddenly, my plan to scare Bruce into confessing seemed like a bad idea. I needed clear evidence of betrayal, and I understood that confrontation could nullify everything, or even make it impossible to prove it. But now, knowing the likely time and place of their likely betrayal, I could almost certainly gather the information, the evidence that I needed to be sure. I folded up the bed and sat on the sofa, clenching my teeth in rage, my heart pounding. I've been cheated a couple of times in business deals, and I remember being cheated at cards once, but never in my life have I felt anything remotely resembling such betrayal. I was on the verge of screaming, crying, yelling, and punching the wall all at the same time. But gradually, from this emotional whirlpool, one burning desire began to emerge. The desire to get even. I calmed down a little and began to think about my situation trying to think as detached and unemotional as possible. I thought about the vulnerabilities of Bruce and my wife, and how I could exploit those weaknesses to gain some gratification for my wounded ego. When I had hard evidence, my first fantasy was to beat the crap out of Bruce, but I only saw that as a prison sentence. My second thought was to refuse the loan and insist that all outstanding money be returned to me immediately. But I remembered what Bernie told me once when I was considering financing from a bank that was being particularly aggressive. He advised against it, saying that if you owe someone money, especially someone who doesn't have your best interests at heart, then they have you by the balls. I wanted to take Bruce by the balls. Looking back into Bruce's office, I saw him standing and shaking hands with the supplier. I waved and smiled. He waved back, walked the supplier to the door, and then hurried back to the break room. Hey, Mike, did you forget something? Do you need more information? I shook my head and smiled. Listen, Bruce, I've thought about it, and I want to say that I may have given the wrong impression today. I really hope you understand that I think you are a great businessman, and I think you have a real opportunity to win with this store. But as I was leaving, I realized that perhaps I had expressed myself incorrectly when I asked about your plans in case things didn't go the way you wanted. He smiled back. Oh, no, Mike, I got it. Any good businessman asks difficult questions. Great, great. 
I just want to make sure you know that I really love what you're doing here. Besides, you're a family member, and I have to feel that this is not just a safe investment. It is the right decision for you as a friend and family member and as a good businessman. So I didn't want you to go home without knowing for sure that I plan to try very hard to get this money for you. And I can't imagine that we won't get it. Like I said, I don't have that much in my personal accounts, so I'll have to ask for the trust fund withdrawal. But honestly, I'm pretty sure I can get Bernie to cave in and we'll get the money for you. Bruce listened with an expectant grin on his face that grew wider as I spoke. Oh, man, that sounds great. I'm telling you, this business is on the verge of taking off, so this loan is as safe with me as it is with the bank. You don't need to worry one bit. I'm not worried at all, Bruce. Bernie, of course, will have to draw up some kind of agreement since he will insist on protecting the trust. With collateral and such, I can get everything signed within a few days. If you have no problem with this, I think you will receive the money within a week. The next morning, I walked into Bernie's office, closed the door, and plopped down in a chair. Bernie was talking on the phone, making some notes, and raised one finger up, indicating that he would soon be able to speak. I was visibly fidgeting while he was ending the call, and he obviously noticed this because after hanging up, he looked at me in confusion and asked, So, Mike, what made you so nervous this morning? Clearing my throat, I leaned forward slightly to speak. Bernie, I think I'm going to need access to a trust to get a fairly large loan. Yes, I think this should not be a problem. What, uh, what kind of loan and how many? He turned on the computer with his mouse and clicked a couple of icons, opening a spreadsheet that summarized the trust fund data. I cleared my throat again and leaned even closer. Look, Bernie, before we start filling out the paperwork, the first thing I want from you is absolute confidentiality. Of course, I always know, listen. I want you to understand that this is unusual and it might be tempting to talk to Seth or anyone else here at work or in the family. I don't want anyone other than you and me to understand what exactly I'm trying to do here. He shifted in his chair, wrinkled his brow, and after hesitating a little, began to answer. Mike, if this is illegal, it's not illegal. Not at all. What I really want you to do is create a document that is the pinnacle of sound legality. He shook his head and I continued. I want to borrow some money and I want you to draw up loan documents. I want the terms of the loan to be very clear. I want the loan to be properly collateralized by the very business for which I plan to provide it and that the penalties for non-payment are very, very clearly stated. It sounds like you're expecting a default. It's like you want to lure the guy into a trap. More or less. So who are you trying to trap and why? I hesitated for a minute before answering and then looked him straight in the eyes. I want to trap my brother-in-law, Bruce, and the reason is Olivia. He raised his eyebrows in surprise and opened his mouth several times to answer, but never said a word. Finally he drank from a glass of water standing on the table and said breathlessly, Are you, uh, sure about this? Very, I replied. Very. Within a week the document was completed and I personally brought it to Bruce for him to review and sign. He asked his lawyer, a small, muscular guy named Tim Sowers, who also happened to be his cousin, to sit down with us to review the document. Okay, Sowers began. I looked at it last night and it's pretty much what I expected from a business loan. But there are a couple of things I'd like to point out, Bruce, before you sign. Okay? Bruce flashed his gala smile. As always, agreeable and clueless as always. Of course. Give me the information. Tim Sowers cleared his throat and looked closely at Bruce. I thought I caught a hint of contempt in his gaze, as if he knew how little Bruce understood about running a business. Okay, first thing, this $425,000 loan will be repaid over seven years. You've got a pretty standard rate here. Payments will begin immediately, a little more than 6000 per month. Bruce nodded. 
The actual amount you will receive will be only $365,000. Since we are combining it with your loan taken out a couple of years ago, Mike will get his $60,000 back and you will get the rest. It's clear. Understand? I see. Italian, Bruce answered smugly with a slight Italian accent. Tim looked at him again and sighed quietly. Okay, next, the loan is secured by collateral. It is tied to your business as well as the property above Keokuk. Is this where they hunt ducks? A uh, yes. Bruce pointed to Bernie while talking to Sowers. They, uh, want to make sure Mike's trust is protected in case the business does go under. He winced briefly and then quickly. But that won't happen. Business is in great shape. I think so. And Bernie Black seems to think so. He nodded at me and smiled. And Mike definitely thinks so. Really? Mike? Oh yes, I replied with as much enthusiasm as possible. Bruce showed me the books and I think he has a winner here. I smiled, but, well, I don't know if you know Bernie or not, but he's very, very conservative and always considers the worst case scenario. He wants to be absolutely sure that the trust is protected. So it is important to him that if for some impossible reason the business fails, there is something to reimburse the trust. Sowers frowned and then glared at Bruce. Do you understand that if you default, you may well lose the business transferred to the trust? Maybe even land for duck hunting? This has been in our family for a long time. Certainly. Bruce spoke seriously, perhaps trying to convey to Sowers that he understood the warning and took it very seriously. I understand the consequences. Still would. But honestly, I'm very confident in the business and I think it's much safer to take out this loan than to try to run the business without it. Do you understand that already three months after an insufficient payment, fines begin to accrue? Right? I certainly understand. He smiled at me as if we shared some secret, as if he understood that I would never allow Bernie to impose punitive damages for anything but the most egregious violations. I simply smiled. Back at home, Olivia was overjoyed. She went on and on about how well Bruce's business would do now that he had enough money to solve his major problems. Somehow I managed not to blurt out what I really wanted to say, namely that the main problem is Bruce himself and no amount of money will solve I. But over the next few weeks, keeping my mouth shut about Bruce's business acumen was the easiest thing I had to do when I was around Olivia. I needed more information before I could end my marriage the way I wanted, and it would take a little time, so I knew that I would have to control my emotions, which vary daily from melancholy to rage and disgust. When I thought about her betrayal, having dinner with her without exploding became a challenge, and sex became something to be avoided if possible. And when I had no out, I was forced to rely on memories of a rather dirty sexual encounter. Many years ago, when I was 18, my friends and I went to San Diego for spring break. One night, we found ourselves in Tijuana to blow off some steam. We drank, watched some pretty explicit and frankly, gut-wrenching sex shows, and ended up with a few sluts. Somehow, I ended up paired with a woman in her 30s who had obviously lived a pretty hard life. She was not particularly attractive, and perhaps even worse than I remember, given that my ideas of aesthetic beauty were undoubtedly impaired by a rather high blood alcohol level. But even in this state, I had serious doubts about taking her to bed, and I began to come up with excuses, trying to get out. But my friends haunted me, questioning my masculinity, my sexual orientation, and all that jazz. Feeling like I had no choice, I put on a fakey smile, quickly downed a couple more drinks, gritted my teeth, and followed her into the damp, unkempt private room above the bar to get down to business. Now, in order to get the job done, so to speak, I found that I had to pretend that she wasn't there, that she was just some kind of sexual device. I ended up using her like a piece of meat, having her and enjoying her despite the noise from the bar, the claustrophobic room, the dirty sheets, and the bad smell she gave off. 
So over the next few weeks, when I had sex with Olivia, she became that slut in my imagination again. I closed my eyes, held my emotional nose, and had her like I had that poor Mexican girl all those years ago. Nothing tender, no affection, just a biological function. Once I started, it became almost too easy to have her as hard and fast as I could. I was very brutal with my technique. Unsurprisingly, Olivia noticed the changes and eventually mentioned it. She complained that she wished she could at least have had some gentle, romantic sex when we got into bed, but overall, she didn't seem to mind having we had it and considered it, on the whole, an improvement compared to the sex we had had up to that point. I think in another life she would have made good money from American tourists. In Tijuana! Obtaining irrefutable evidence of an affair turned out to be about as easy as I thought. Bruce used some of the money to remodel the store itself a bit, and throughout the day there were quite a few workers wandering around doing some repairs. I guessed correctly that without anyone noticing, the electrician, who had $500 of my money in his back pocket, would place a camera and recording device in one of the light fixtures on a Monday morning, a month or so after Bruce received the money above the sofa in the lounge room, and in two days he will clean everything up. I now had a pretty good idea of what Bruce and Olivia were up to, so I figured I was prepared for what I'd see from the camera. I decided that I would sit in my office at work with a drink and some chips and take it all in as dispassionately as possible, as if I were watching a movie. It turns out that seeing your wife having sex with another guy is much worse than just realizing it's happening. Much, much worse. By the end of the recording, I had drunk so much scotch that I couldn't get home, trashed my desk, puked twice, and threw a paperweight at my office door. The details are basically what you'd expect. I went to the beginning of the day on Tuesday and began to look there at a fast speed until I saw the figure of a woman in a blue dress with a large shopping bag suddenly enter the room, take fresh sheets from the bag, and lay them out on the sofa. I immediately slowed the recording down to normal speed and saw with a feeling of grim confirmation that the woman was indeed Olivia. After changing the sheets, she opened the bag again and took out a bottle of wine and two glasses. She took off her blue dress, folded it neatly, and put it in her bag, and then waited, wearing thigh-high stockings, French-cut panties, and a very revealing bra. Reading a novel while sitting on the edge of the bed, it felt strangely surreal, reminding me a little of a strange performance art exhibition I once saw in New York, where a scantily clad young woman was reading strange New Age poetry to an audience who were more concerned with her breasts than with the poetry. When Bruce finally entered the room, Olivia put her book down, smiled, and stood up to hug him. Then she pushed him away, slightly reproaching him for making her wait for his arrival. He replied that her problem was that she could never wait for him to come, and they both chuckled at the old joke, they kissed for a few minutes, and then Olivia reached for his belt, unbuttoned his pants, and pulled them down around his ankles along with his underwear. The sex I saw was not mind-blowing. I got the feeling that this was their route Iny as they silently changed, each anticipating what the next step would be. Sex wasn't interesting. He had it hard, using a constant rhythm like a metronome, which I would have found boring if I hadn't felt outraged. Around the ten-minute mark, Bruce climaxed, and I got the feeling that Olivia was doing it at the same time from the way she suddenly stretched out her legs and threw her head back. They lay there in silence for a few moments until he rolled onto his side and they began to kiss. By the time they finally finished, I was so hurt and furious. I knew that the pictures I had seen were imprinted on my consciousness like an indelible scar that would never be erased and accordingly would not allow me to forgive either of these two traitors. And I was glad that I had a plan to end, not save my marriage. As I leaned forward to turn off the video, I noticed they started talking in bed. Olivia lay on her side, head raised, resting her right hand on her bent right elbow, and lazily drew patterns on the chest of Bruce lying on his back. They looked at each other, whispered quietly, and smiled with satisfaction. Olivia began to quietly complain about having to use the furniture store as her love nest. Bruce turned on his side and answered, Come on, live. If we use the hotel, 
We'll definitely leave marks, and we almost got caught using one of our houses. We really have no choice. Olivia shrugged. I know, I know. But I really wish we had another place to play. I just don't like this room, and changing last week's dirty sheets before making love doesn't exactly excite me. Bruce reached out and stroked her cheek, smiling. Well, we could always just run away together. Olivia laughed in response and Bruce's expression turned thoughtful, his smile fading a little. Seriously, Liv, have you ever regretted marrying Mike? I mean, I love Mindy, and she's a good wife, but sometimes I don't know if you think that it would be better if maybe instead of them, you and I got married. Olivia sat up on the bed so that she was essentially sitting with her back against the back of the sofa, her arms wrapped around her knees, which were pulled up to her chest. She looked at Bruce thoughtfully before answering. Come on, Bruce. How many times should we repeat this? What we have is special. Very special. But no, I don't think it would be better if we got married. Of course, we would be very happy together. But I also love Mike, and you love Mindy. If you and I were together, it would be just us. Mike is a very monogamous guy, and he would never pursue a relationship with me if I were married. And I don't think Mindy would be very happy with that either. She leaned over and kissed Bruce on the cheek, rubbing his chest with her left hand. The truth is, Bruce, people like you and me have a great gift of love. We can love more than one person at a time, and we must love more than one person. This is right for us. But Mindy and Mike are not like that. Their self-restraint tendencies mean that they will never be able to do what you and I do. They will never be able to keep their emotions in check and make everyone happy. Hearing this, my indignation reached its peak. And that's when I sent my paperweight through the office door. Because I loved her. Or maybe because she was the only woman who ever loved me. I never realized how arrogant, delusional, and narcissistic my wife was. In her mind, she somehow turned her infidelities into some kind of virtue for her. Obviously, this was not an act that represented a stab in the back of her lawful husband, but rather something that increased the love in the world. Something she not only had a right to, but also a moral imperative. I slept on the couch in my office that night and completed all the necessary paperwork the next morning. When I returned home the next evening, Olivia greeted me with her hands on her hips and a sour expression on her face. Where the hell were you last night? I was terribly worried. You didn't call. You didn't write. You didn't give me the slightest idea. What the hell? I stopped her with a raised hand yesterday evening. I was at work. I got drunk and couldn't go home, so I stayed there. She looked at me with complete bewilderment. Wait, what? Are you drunk at work? I smiled and nodded back at her and she continued. Well, at least you could let me know what's going on. I almost called the police. And why the hell were you drinking at work? She was still looking at me, but there was utter bewilderment in her question. Without answering, I walked past her into the living room, sat down on the sofa, put my feet on the coffee table, took the briefcase on my lap and opened it. Olivia let out an indignant sigh as she followed me into the living room and angrily sat down in the chair opposite the sofa. Hey, how about some answers, Mike? Hmm. Why did you drink so much at work? What happened last night? What's happening? I continued rummaging through my case and pulled out a couple of folders, placing them one by one on the couch next to me. Just a second, Liv. I want to tidy things up a little. I sorted the papers a little more, took my legs off the table, replaced them with papers, and leaned forward. I rubbed my hands together as if anticipating a sumptuous meal, looked at Olivia, and smiled. Okay, then. Let's get started. What? Let's begin. Yeah, well, after what happened last night. Last night? What happened last night? 
Olivia's aggressive attitude quickly gave way to something more passive. When I got home, I began to sense her slight fear. Can you at least tell me what you did last night? Oh, yeah, I watched the video. Mm. Yeah, I saw the video of you and Bruce having sex on that couch in the lounge, and I thought it was a little disturbing, so maybe I went a little overboard. You understand? I smiled thinly, emotionlessly, at Olivia, whose face went from bewilderment to shock to shock, fear and confusion. Her mouth was half open, making small spasmodic movements, barely opening and closing, unable to utter a single meaningful sound. Her eyes, wet and increasingly wet, darted back and forth from the papers on the table to the door and to me, as if she was expecting someone or something to come through the door, put the papers away and everything would get better. Finally, she spoke. I... I don't understand, Mike. What are you talking about? Come on, Olivia, you can't be that stupid. I'm talking about you and Bruce and what you two did yesterday and every other fucking Tuesday for a year. I gestured to the papers lying in front of me. I'm talking about the end of our marriage. Olivia gasped suddenly and covered her mouth. For a moment I waited for her to answer. Mike, we can work things out. I think I can make you understand. Oh, I think I understand, Liv. I took a DVD out of my briefcase, held it in my hands, and then pushed it across the table towards her. Last night, I received all kinds of information to help me understand. Indeed, a veritable gold mine of new facts about my loving wife and my friendly brother-in-law. She stared at the DVD like she was looking at a poisonous snake, physically recoiling slightly, but making no effort to grasp it. Come on, live. This is your copy. I won't tell you how I got it, but I have my own for future reference and to further teach your philosophy of love and devotion. She leaned forward and started to stand up, and for a moment it looked like she was going to come towards me. But I raised my hand and stopped her, and she sat down. She bit her lip for a second, and then, looking straight at me, she spoke again, slowly and deliberately, with a kind of false confidence that I suspect was meant to hide the trembling in her voice. Mike, listen. You have to open your mind and think about this. There is no point for you to destroy your life, our lives, because we have different values and talents. I love you and have always been willing to accommodate our differences. And I hope that... I interrupted her with a mocking snort. Different values and talents? Seriously, do you think cheating on your husband is some kind of talent? Because honestly, Liv, I'm sure everyone is capable of this. Seriously, talent is not the right word. She took a deep breath and looked at the ceiling for a moment and then back at me. Ability. I think the right word is ability. I have greater capacity to love, and I can and have successfully loved more than one person at a time. Apart from outdated ideas about love and relationships, there are no reasons in which I cannot or should not use my ability. Please, just stop. Honestly, you're just annoying me with your excuses. I understand that you think that you have some special ability that gives you the right to deceive, lie, and cheat when you should be faithful, but really, that's just Liv's bullshit excuse. Anyone can be romantically involved with multiple people at the same time. This does not make them lovers with great ability. It just makes them cheaters. In the blink of an eye, the apologetic, conciliatory Olivia was gone, replaced by an angry, aggressive, extremely self-confident vixen. Are you calling me a cheater? She attacked me. Well, fair enough. From your point of view, it probably is. But then again, I never lost or suppressed my love for you or my love for Bruce. So I never betrayed my emotions, never compromised my feelings for my actions because of some medieval code that says I must limit my relationships to one person and one person only. So, yes, I may look like a cheater to you, but when I look in the mirror, I have no problems with what I see. No doubts about what I did. None. 
She was breathing heavily and passionately. Her face and chest were flushed. There was a fire in her eyes, a look that made me challenge her, and I quit. Not use my ability. Please, just stop. Honestly, you're just annoying me with your excuses. I understand that you think that you have some special ability that gives you the right to deceive, lie, and cheat when you should be faithful, but really, that's just Liv's bullshit excuse. Anyone can be romantically involved with multiple people at the same time. This does not make them lovers with great ability. It just makes them cheaters. In the blink of an eye, the apologetic, conciliatory Olivia was gone, replaced by an angry, aggressive, extremely self-confident vixen. Are you calling me a cheater? She attacked me. Well, fair enough. From your point of view, it probably is. But then again, I never lost or suppressed my love for you or my love for Bruce. So I never betrayed my emotions, never compromised my feelings for my actions because of some medieval code that says I must limit my relationships to one person and one person only. So, yes, I may look like a cheater to you, but when I look in the mirror, I have no problems with what I see. No doubts about what I did. None. She was breathing heavily and passionately. Her face and chest were flushed. There was a fire in her eyes, a look that made me challenge her, and I quit. This was my meeting, as if he thought I should continue, but I simply held my arms out in an expectant gesture and waited for him to state his case. He licked his lips nervously and ran a trembling hand through his hair before going on about how he had every intention of returning the money but was a little short on money at the moment. He talked about how Bernie plays hardball and doubted I knew how hard he was pressuring him to pay. He then went on to say that the business was on the brink of recovery and that with a little time he would be able to get his head above water. Finally, he ended up trying to prove that I would be in a better financial situation if I gave him more time. I leaned back in my chair slowly, carefully studying Bruce's nervous smile, the thin film of sweat that formed on his forehead, and the poorly controlled trembling that his right hand showed as it lay on the table between us. Bruce, if you weren't an outright deceiver, I would consider giving you a reprieve. His eyes went wide with surprise and distress and he leaned forward, about to protest when I stopped him with a race at hand. Come on, Bruce. You have to understand that it's almost impossible to trust a man who hasn't given a second thought to screwing his married daughter-in-law. You should know that asking the same woman's husband for financial help is simply ridiculous. Bruce shifted uncomfortably in his seat while Olivia nervously cleared her throat and spoke in a plaintive voice. Mike, please. You can't punish Bruce just because I can do whatever the hell I want. Olivia, I snapped, giving her a look of pure hostility. Why are you here anyway? I thought maybe I could talk you into it for old time's sake. I'm still worried about you, and I thought that I interrupted her sharply and loudly. You thought wrong. Honestly, your presence just reminds me of how Bruce figuratively fucked me by literally fucking you. So do yourself and Bruce a favor and sit back and try to look nice and keep comments to an absolute minimum. There were tears in her eyes and her chin began to wrinkle. But she did what I insisted and calmly sat back in her chair. I turned back to Bruce. Okay, Bruce, that's how it will be. You will repay the debt on time according to a strict schedule, or I will begin the working off process to get everything I can from the collateral. Bruce shook his head aggressively. Come on, Mike. You can't take my business away from me. You cannot. I can and I will if you don't pay. Bruce, my advice is to get money. Reach out to your family. Find a bank, sell something, I don't care. Just get the money or I'll take whatever I can get. But, but you know that banks don't give me loans. Otherwise, I would have turned to them first. And my family can't help. They don't have that kind of money. I look Bruce straight in the eyes. Don't tell me all this nonsense about how your family doesn't have money. I know they do. No, no. They would help if they could, but they just can't. 
What about her? I pointed my finger at Olivia. Did you ask her for money? Bruce sat back down. Liv. Liv doesn't. I laughed. Of course I have. I wrote her a check for 150000 She has plenty of money. Really? Olivia. I looked at Olivia with a smirk and Bruce looked at her with a question on his face. As I suspected, he did not know about the lump sum payment. She suddenly felt nervous, perhaps a little nauseous. Well, yes, I have it. But I need this money. I laughed again. Stop. Liv, I remember how safe you thought it was to give money to Bruce when you talked me into helping in the first place. Why are you hesitating now? Aren't you confident that Bruce can get his business back on track? Don't you want to help convince me that he's good for the money? If you think this is a good investment for me, then why not for you? I gave her an expectant, evil grin. She swallowed hard, looked at Bruce for a second, and then back at me. Taking a deep breath, she squared her shoulders and said in a vaguely defiant tone that she could certainly make up the difference for a while. Bruce smiled at her. She smiled back weakly, and they walked away, Bruce walking with more confidence and... Olivia walking with disappointment. As I held the door open for them, I left them with one last instruction. Remember, Bruce, I don't care how. I just need money. You will get your money. He spat back at me. Olivia looked worried. Over the next few months, I continued to try to find solace in my work. Business-like and efficient with everyone, I continued to avoid any personal conversations at all costs, completely refusing any social opportunities, preferring instead to work or be alone. I tried desperately not to think about my wife's betrayal and betrayal, but everything reminded me of her. Even, of course, the monthly check from Bruce that was lying on my desk. The check brought some kind of bitter satisfaction, the feeling that to some extent, I was able to plunge the authors of my misfortune into poverty. Things got a little worse when Mindy contacted me. She emailed me several times and even called me on the phone. I was quite surprised to learn that Bruce and Olivia had confessed to her, no doubt a softened version of their affair, and that she had taken it rather hard at first, but had eventually forgiven them both. To my disappointment and horror, she vaguely hinted that she guessed that they were lovers and that they had come to some kind of agreement in which Bruce and Olivia continued to see each other. She even made a half-serious attempt to convince me to consider getting Olivia back. My responses were bitter and harsh, and I was sure that by the end of the second call I had left her in tears, after which I never heard from her again. Minnie's obvious tolerance made it clear that the emotional price Bruce and Olivia paid was far less than I had hoped. Now I was very afraid that somehow the store would become solvent, that Bruce would pay off his debt, that he would pay off Olivia, and that they would all be satisfied with the outcome, both financially and emotionally. That they would leave me behind, shaking their heads at the poor soul who just couldn't understand what modern love was. I shouldn't have worried. The furniture showroom burned down nine months after I met Bruce and Olivia. It was a spectacular two-alarm fire that threatened several nearby buildings and made the nightly news. I didn't see the plot, but Bernie did, and he called me immediately to discuss the implications. He was angry at me for taking such a risk because he was sure that the trust had flushed quite a large amount of money down the toilet. I reassured him by promising to personally buy the loan if he defaulted, assuring him that the property itself was worth something simply because of its location. Obvious questions were asked about the fire, and when catalysts were discovered, the insurance company immediately refused to pay. With no income from the store, Bruce defaulted on the loan, and I purchased the smoking ruins of the property and 35 acres of Mississippi duck hunting land. The criminal investigation lasted almost six months. The detectives have put together a pretty good circumstantial case against Bruce and Olivia. They were able to prove that the store was losing money and Olivia was shelling out more and more money every month to keep it afloat. 
Bruce made several desperate attempts to obtain loans from other sources failed, and then, as quietly as possible, made a last-ditch attempt to sell the business. But there were no buyers even at a greatly reduced price. Investigators could find no evidence that Olivia or Bruce were near the store on the night of the fire or that they purchased anything to start or precipitate it. But their case was built on the theory that they hired a professional to set the store on fire. They found numerous searches containing the term arson on Olivia's home computer phone records showing communications with at least two men with arson convictions and noted that she had withdrawn 15000 in cash the week before the fire. Olivia and Bruce had a pretty good lawyer, no doubt bought with whatever money she had left. And the DA knew he was going to have a fight, so he started making deals. I'm guessing they started with first-degree arson and fraud charges and then went from there. The defense wouldn't settle for anything less than fourth-degree arson, so a game of tag began to set a trial date. I was on the witness list, waiting in the lobby outside on the first day of the trial. Sitting on the hard wooden bench, I was reading the newspaper and absentmindedly tapping my foot on the tile floor when a court official came out and announced that the trial was canceled, that they had finally made a deal, and that we could all go home. As I was gathering my things to leave, Olivia and Bruce walked in from the hall, accompanied by several officers and their lawyer. Several reporters jumped up and shoved microphones under their noses. But they declined to comment and the reporters turned to their lawyer. Bruce met with Mindy and walked out of the foyer with several officers, but Olivia looked my way and didn't hesitate to approach me to talk. I must admit that I admired her courage to face me under such circumstances. Well, Mike, is this your lucky day? Is this what you wanted for me to be punished for my sins? I laughed bitterly and shook my head mockingly. I wanted to have a faithful wife and a successful marriage. I'll never get what I want from you. Absent that, I just want my money. She snorted. Well, you're not getting any of this now, are you? Oh, I got some of this back. And I have a store. She laughed. And what are you going to do about it as it stopped smoking it? You'd be surprised what a smart businessman can do with a good piece of property, even a smoking one. Her nostrils flared and her face hardened a little. She took a deep breath and paused before speaking again. And now you are happier alone without anyone, married to your job for the foreseeable future. She gave me a knowing smirk. Don't deny it. I know you. I know how much you hate meeting new people. I'm working on it. Liv, I loved you, but you are not the only woman in the world. She smiled confidently. No, not the only one. But I don't think you can find, what do you businessmen call it? Equivalent replacement. Whether you like it or not, you will miss me. I leaned towards her and whispered in her ear, I might be a little lonely. But you won't be, will you? The good news is that you'll be sharing a cramped space with a bunch of pretty, androgynous women with whom you can share all that abundant love you have. This will be beneficial for both you and the lesbians. Olivia surprised me by suddenly losing her composure at my last remark, recoiling from me as if I were radioactive, her face a mask of contempt and her eyes flashing with anger. She took a deep breath, her chest heaving aggressively a couple of times, and then she exploded. You fucking sanctimonious, self-centered, emotionally damaged asshole. She screamed as the officers dragged her away from me and toward the door. You will be in the same hole as me, alone, without anyone, married to my fucking slave. As I watched her scream at me, her love for me completely evaporated, leaving only contemptuous hatred. I was overcome by a sudden wave of melancholy. I resisted the urge to react in a way that would reveal my pain, smiled thinly, and muttered some quips about her public use of rather offensive language, but she just continued her diatribe as if I hadn't said anything. But very little. Time will pass, and I will leave my prison and move on with my life, and you will remain alone, wanting to be with me. And then, many years from now, when you're married to some boring ex-secretary, you'll still regret not agreeing. The door closed behind her, abruptly ending the rest of her tirade. 
I turned and walked out of the courtroom. My day was cleared of judgment, and now, without any meetings or conferences, struggling with a growing sense of despondency and loneliness, I went to the burnt site and thought about my life. The temperature dropped and the wind continued to whip my jacket and sting my face as I looked around, still wondering what I could do with the wreckage. I wasn't sure if I could even save the situation, and my main desire was to sell everything, forget about the loss, and focus on what I had always done. It was safe, perhaps even smart. But I knew there was another option. You could take a risk and rebuild, maybe even open another furniture store. I was thinking about the possibility of successfully selling furniture from the same place where Bruce failed. I was thinking about making a big deal out of it, with lots of advertising, billboards, maybe even TV commercials, something that Bruce and my ex couldn't miss. I could even call it Olivia's and have lots of last-minute sales. It struck me that the decisions I would make regarding the site were similar to those I had unconsciously made regarding my life in general. Olivia was right about me. My natural inclination, in fact, my only social inclination before meeting her, was to withdraw, avoid the risk of intimacy, and focus on work. I saw myself inexorably approaching a life of loneliness, a financially secure but relatively joyless existence. I again became what suited me, doing something safe. Sitting down on the concrete block, I looked around again, still weighing my options, still contemplating my future. I was stuck between my fears and desires, the ingrained habits that served and defined me, and the desire to change, to be different. I was about to leave and go back to work, let things slide, and put off the decision for another day, when a few rays of late afternoon sun filtered through the clouds and between the buildings and illuminated the graffiti-covered wall across the street. The light cast a burning orange glow on the wall, giving the concrete and lettering an incandescent quality. The words were written in bold white letters, clear and easy to read. Take action! I have always been disdainful of superstitious people and the way they allow meaningless, objectively irrelevant things to rule their lives as signs or habits. But here, sitting on a concrete slab in the November cold, these words seemed to me like fate, a message from God. I took out my cell phone and called the office, calling my assistant. Hey, Sherry, who's the architecture firm that designed the new shopping center that's getting all the press? The one with glass and fountains? Uh, Hummer. Something like that, I think. She chuckled lightly to herself for a couple of moments while she checked. Yes, Hammerstone. Looks like they're based here in Chicago. Okay, listen, could you arrange a meeting with me as soon as possible? She hesitated for a second. Are we, uh, building something? I looked around the area, mentally imagining the new store, and suddenly felt a surge of confidence. Yes. Yes, I think we, I think so. Um, okay. Sure, boss. Anything else? I chewed my lip for a second as my eyes fell on the graffiti on the opposite side of the street. Again reading the imperative again act. Yes, Sherry, there is one more thing. Do you remember that representative in the counterfeit jeans? The tall blonde. Brenda? Brenda White, I think. Yes. Sherry's voice became increasingly incredulous, and I wondered if she thought I was having some sort of breakdown. Can you give me your number? Of course. Of course, boss. Do you want me to connect it? No, no, I'll call myself. Thank you. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you. And go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one.